Hey there, it's your career insider, Cindy Thomas. Welcome to season three of the Insider's Career Club podcast, where industry professionals share the inside, they've got that in air quotes, scoop on their careers. Listeners know that I'm an HR career professional who's been in TA for over 25 years. But did you also know that I coach clients and help them plan and grow their careers, manage career transitions, help refine your interviewing skills, or I can help you work on a job search strategy. Now, have you been passed over for a promotion or a raise? Maybe you're frustrated because you're interviewing but not getting the job offer. If that's happened to you, let me help you get back on track. Sign up for a free coaching call today with me at insiderscareerclub.com. Remember, it's possible for you to have a great and a fulfilling career. Let's get you the career you deserve. Now, don't go anywhere. Up next is a great podcast. Stay tuned. Today's special guest is Christina Berge. She holds a BA in psychology, a BS in nursing, and a master's degree in nursing. During the pandemic, we could only guess what it was like in the hospitals for our ends. But Christina doesn't have to guess because she was there. She's going to share her story on what it was like, truly like, to be a healthcare worker during the pandemic. Let's welcome her into the show. Well, good afternoon, Christina. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm really good. I'm just real excited to be able to speak with you today. Me too. I'm very excited to talk about this topic and something near and dear to my heart. Right, right. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up. So I grew up in Bedford, New Hampshire. It's a small town next to Manchester, about an hour from Boston. And I now live in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm the oldest of five. My youngest siblings are 12 years younger than I am. They're twins. So I have grew up in a loud, crazy family with four dogs, five kids, two amazing parents. And I learned a lot of responsibility by having such younger siblings too. Yeah, I bet you were a great help because there was such a gap. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your career. Uh, When you were considering careers, what made you decide to go into nursing? It's a great question. My mom is a nurse. She worked as a nurse when I was really little and then became a nurse practitioner and went into the pharmaceutical industry. But she was very caring. And I grew up and a lot of women in my family were nurses. So I always knew what the experience was and what kind of profession it was. And I love taking care of people. Uh So I got great advice from my mom. She said, if you want to be a nurse, go become a nursing assistant. See if you like it. And if you like that, then you can become a nurse. But if you can't handle that, then it's not for you. And I loved being a nursing assistant. So I decided to go into nursing. Oh, great. So what are the natural skills and abilities that someone should have if they want to go into nursing? I think the biggest one is compassion and empathy. If you Mm -hmm. aren't able to sympathize with the patient what they're Mm -hmm. going through because there are very difficult patients who they could be yelling at you and they're in the worst moments of their life because they're sick or something serious happened I think the rest can be taught the compassion and empathy is a skill that you need to naturally have okay yeah and then from an educational standpoint what does that look like what's the educational prep that you need to become a Um, Question. It's kind of all over the place with nursing. So it depends on what you want to be. Um, I know there's LPNs, RNs, BSNs, NPs, whatnot. So I did the BSN route and I did it in an unconventional way. So I went to school for psychology. My mom gave me that great advice, said, if you want to become a nurse before you go down the rabbit hole of going back to school and all that stuff, go work as a nursing assistant. So I got that experience and I graduated from St. Anselm College in New Hampshire and Mm -hmm. I went to accelerated nursing school. So I had my bachelor's already and I did a 16 month intensive program, which got me my BSN. So I went to school full time, did clinicals and everything. So it was like a four year degree in one in 16 months. I used to hire nurses for Kaiser Permanente. 
Oh, so yes. I remember you saying that. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I really got a good insight into what some of the preparation nurses need, but then also the versatility of um, yeah. what's available to you. What's the next step for becoming able to work as an RN? So you have to study your butt off to take your boards and the boards is the same for everyone. It's actually the wildest thing ever because I'm studying for my NP boards right now and it's a lot different where mm -hmm. the NP boards is 150 questions. That's it. You take it, you see if you pass the NCLEX, which is the nursing boards after you graduate from nursing school, mm -hmm. it's, it ranges from 70 questions to 249 or something. And after 70 questions, it can shut off at any time and you don't know if you passed or failed. So it can be a quick one hour test or it turns into five hours. Oh, wow. um, but it tests you on everything humanly possible in a nursing perspective. And then once you pass that, you are eligible to get a job. Wow. wow. And I got every single question. So I was there for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> you poor thing. I kept thinking it was going to shut off. It never did. You kept hoping, I'm sure. I know. I was praying. I left in tears. I'll be honest. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> me when but I passed. I, um, got a teaching credential. Yeah, it was a traumatic thing. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah. Any any exam is tough. Yes, yes. Can you talk to us about the additional training you had to get to be up to speed to working directly on the floor with patients on your own? So I worked on a cardiac unit when I first started as a nurse and they were great. It was a new grad program at a community hospital. So I got hired immediately and I was working with patients within the first week, but I wasn't on my own. So yeah. the first three months I had someone watching over me, teaching me how to do everything. And then yeah, after three months, they kind of give you, you go through courses too. Like how do you mm -hmm. read an EKG? How do you monitor a patient who's on this specific drip or specific medications that might be worrisome. Like they really do get you ready for it. And then once they think you're safe, then you're on your own. And that's probably the scariest day as a nurse, because then you're just completely on your, no your own and you don't feel ready for it no matter when you do it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like anything else. You, you have your period of training and then you, you're off on your own. Right. And yeah, um, exactly. I'm sure there were other people around to, to check in with if you had questions, but it's still scary being on yeah. your own. Yeah. Thank yep. You. It's always good to ask a million questions. That's the best advice I got was if you don't know the answer, ask someone because it's someone's life on the line. So what were some of the other specialty options you could have chosen to train or work in at the hospital? I picked cardiac med surge because that's where the opportunity was as a new grad. It's kind of hard to get your dream job right away. So I wanted mm -hmm. to go into oncology but it's hard to get into oncology right away. So I decided to do med surge, but you could do ICU, pediatrics if you wanted to, the OR, really anything as long as they're willing to train a new grad. Yeah. So I went into med surge, which was a cardiac focus, but it was all types of patients. Anyone who needed to be on a cardiac monitor, I basically saw, which was really good for me to get my foundation because I was you know, able to know that I can completely take care of a patient and I feel comfortable doing it with whatever they walk in with. Mm. And then that's when I made another move to move into what I wanted to do, which was oncology. So okay. I did a year of cardiac med surge and then I moved into oncology. Okay. So when you were on cardiac med surge, what was your patient ratio? That one was wild. I was at a community hospital. So my patient ratio during the day was four to one. And then at night it was five or six to one. Okay. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. Actually, I'm used to hearing that. Well, when I started recruiting nurses, I remember hearing nurses say that it was like seven or eight sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Probably because you were in cardiac, it was lower. Yes. Yeah. Imagine. And the yeah. patients were pretty sick because the hospital had a really small ICU and we were the only other floor that would monitor patients for their heart. Mm -hmm. So if they needed any type of monitoring, they'd had to come to us. Okay. So what was it like to work with your patients before COVID-19? I mean, it was very interactive. Before I went to the oncology side, I saw the community setting and I saw what it was like to work in a community, not have as mm -hmm. many resources. There's a lot of doctors or just one doctor for a ton of patients. 
And then I moved over to the academic setting where I worked at Dana-Farber and Brigham Women's in oncology, where it was all academic. So we had resources for everything. So before COVID, Mm -hmm. I mean, I could talk to a doctor and say, this patient really isn't looking great. Can you come see them? Which obviously they did that during COVID, but it was a faster process. Or I gave being able to bring resources into the patient. You know, I could bring a ton of different products into the room, say, oh, if I need this, I'll grab it later. I'll just bring it in right now. Mm-hmm. Whereas COVID, obviously the patients were on restrictions, so I couldn't do that anymore. It was just the little things in the communication between the patients where I, I could sit in their room forever and talk to them or have their family members with them and make sure the family members were able to understand everything going on and they could see the patient. Okay. And then after when COVID hit, the family was not allowed in the room. It was just you and the patient and the doctor, right? Actually, when COVID hit, so I was in the oncology float pool at Brigham. So they have 15 oncology units there. So they have their own float pool for oncology. So I saw every single oncology patient possible there. We were the easiest option to move over to a COVID unit. Mm -hmm. So when we broke out, the first week they told us there's no way we're ever sending oncology nurses over to a COVID unit because that would just be bad for our patients if you had to come back and take care of the oncology patients. Mm -hmm. And then it became abundantly clear that the oncology patients were the ones getting COVID. So they moved us over there quickly. Mm -hmm. And within the first week or so, we were very well supported, but we just didn't have like, there were no longer a lot of N95s. We didn't have the, all of the PPE that we needed. Mm -hmm. And I was working at one of the top academic centers in the world. So if we didn't have the PPE, I was like, Mm -hmm. how are other community hospitals doing this? But the first couple of months, the doctor or first couple of weeks, the doctors weren't even going into the rooms because we didn't have enough PPE. So they were only going to the rooms either once a day or once a shift or if they really needed to. So I was the housekeeper. I was the nursing assistant. I was the doctor. I was the, I wasn't the doctor, obviously, but I was listening to their heart sounds, Mm -hmm. reporting Mm -hmm. back to the doctor. I was the janitor. I did everything. Oh my goodness. Yeah. it, It changed quickly, but we were all willing to do it because it was, there was something bigger going on. Now, did your patient load change? Did you still have four to one or did you actually? Um, so when I got to Brigham, the patient load that we were part of a union. So the patient load during the day was three and okay. during nighttime was four, which I was very blessed with, but we were giving patients chemotherapy. There were bone marrow transplant patients. So they were very mm-hmm. sick. They were IC level mm-hmm. patients that I was taking care of for the most part. Mm-hmm. So the patient load Brigham was very great about how they took care of us. They made sure we only had one to two patients on the COVID unit due to restrictions and precautions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then we had someone outside the rooms at the beginning of COVID when we didn't know what it was, how quickly we could catch it or whatnot. Mm -hmm. We had people watching us put our PP on and off to make sure we were doing it safely. Um, So those were the nursing assistants. So we would take vital signs, do all the blood draws, all of that. Phlebotomy would go in there if they needed to, but we were doing almost everything. They did decrease it to one to two patients, which was amazing. And they gave us a lot of support. So I feel very lucky with how my hospital treated us during COVID because I know some other hospitals just kind of were like throwing them into the fire. Um, Mm -hmm. Where We even had doctors on off shifts volunteering to watch or run different supplies to patients' rooms for the nurses to grab outside the door. Everyone was coming together because there were surgeons who couldn't operate anymore. And they were like, what do I do with my time? So they were mm-hmm. and volunteering to help us too. Wow. It's, when you're not in that kind of a setting, and thank God I didn't have anybody that was in the hospital with COVID, you have no idea. And because mm-hmm. patients' families couldn't come into the room, they, you know, anybody on the outside really didn't get a sense of what was going on. We knew you were dealing with a lot, but we didn't know what it looked like. And, you know, we had this kind of false idea of what was going on in the hospital. So it's really interesting to hear, Christina, what you were dealing with on a physical and day-to-day basis. Now, how did the toll of dealing with patients and being there basically everything affect you? And how did you deal? Um, I kind of classify COVID in two different ways, the first surge and the second surge and whatever happened after the second surge. The first surge, I felt so supported. You were seeing it all over the news. The whole world was shut down. No one 
in the hospital was like, I can't do this. We were all like, we, this is a greater thing. We're doing this for the greater good. There's something bigger than us going on right now. So we are all Mm -hmm. willing to do anything humanly possible. The second surge, our resources were basically run out at that point. So we weren't able to expend all these nurses. The OR was starting back up. We were just starting to get back to a normal way of kind of doing things. And the second surge happened. We weren't complete. Mm -hmm. We weren't opening back up again, but, Mm -hmm. you know, some surgeries were going back on. So we didn't, the surgeons weren't there. The OR nurses weren't there to help us. So we didn't have the resources we had after before Mm -hmm. that. And then I noticed this shift where I wouldn't blame the hospitals for it, but it was just kind of like a misconception of, well, because of COVID, we can't do X, Y, and Z. So there was a lot of restrictions that started to occur, like patients obviously not being able to see their family members. So I was going between a COVID floor and an oncology floor. And obviously I was wearing my PPE, so it was safe. Like I didn't have COVID. I got tested regularly. But even oncology patients, they weren't able to see their families for their last Christmas or their last birthday, because I knew they were sick, they were going to die that year Mm -hmm. because of their cancer, they could no longer come in and see their family. And that was something Mm -hmm. that took a toll on me because my grandfather, I was very close to him. He had leukemia when I was in college and I spent almost every day with him until the end. I knew he was going to die. It was just that last like time I could have with him. So Mm -hmm. I knew what these families were going through and for them not to be able to see their loved ones in those last couple of months, that's what kind of took a toll on me where I was like, this is no longer humane. These patients don't even have COVID and now they're getting affected by it mm-hmm. because their family can't come in and say goodbye. That's hard. And then, you know, you're trying to, to comfort patients that are in emotional distress because of that. Right. And then I started to see, for example, I had one COVID patient. So obviously this was after the second surge Obviously, he had COVID, so his family couldn't come in, but Mm -hmm. he was very disoriented, couldn't speak, couldn't get out of bed. And I was told in report that's how he came into the hospital so that it kind of seemed as if he had had a stroke in the past or something, but it wasn't in his medical history. But he had cancer, so I didn't know if there was something more going on. So I talked to the doctors and I said, you know, he's nonverbal and I hadn't seen his labs yet, but there's a lot going on here that doesn't really make sense. And they're like, no, he came in nonverbal. He came in not being able to walk or talk. And then I saw his labs and his labs were fatal. Like they were not okay. And I I Um, called the doctor. I said, you need to come to the bedside right now. I ended up talking to his daughter on the phone and I said, how long has he not been able to talk for? And she said he was talking when he got into the hospital. And he was able to walk last week. So there was a lot of things going on because of COVID that the full story, what the care wasn't what it was. And I don't think Mm -hmm. we can blame doctors for it. I don't think we can blame nurses or even hospitals. It's just like the stress of it all caused the hospital system and healthcare system to just kind of collapse. Yeah. 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 If it was a short crisis, maybe some of those things wouldn't have happened, but it was so prolonged. Right. There was so little information about exactly mm-hmm. what COVID was and really even how to deal with it. And then you really had no tools, right, from a drug perspective or care. I know that vents were a big, having a, access to vents were a big deal, right? We heard that on the news. Yeah, we had every resource in our power before COVID happened. And then mm-hmm. hearing, well, this patient looks like they're going to go downhill. We only have one more ICU bed in the whole hospital, or we only have one more event. That was wild to me because I was like, if we don't have these resources, what is the rest of the country doing? What is, are these small rural areas doing or the rest of the world doing? I was on an oncology COVID floor, but because of how much it was affecting the community, it turned into oncology COVID, hospice COVID, just med surge COVID. So I saw every type of patient, whether they were dying from COVID or they were okay, but I even saw a 24 year old come in who had no past medical history, just her whole entire system started failing. And we thought we were going to have to vent her. We didn't know if we had a vent for her. And luckily she turned a corner. So she was okay. But when she turned the corner, I said, Oh my gosh, like, what were you feeling before it happened? And she said, I just got sick one day. I was one day a college student. And the next day I was in the hospital about to get vented. Well, yeah. Everybody was wondering what was going on. We were very fearful. I know from my perspective, 
my sister and I we were wearing gloves. We're still wearing gloves and, and masks and, you know, washing our hands a lot and yeah. using hand sanitizer and all of that. And I'm sure a lot of people were doing that. But then other people were not, you know, you right. see people with no masks on at all. Maybe you don't wear gloves, but you, I can remember okay. hearing a man in the supermarket. And this is a guy, he's in one of those little electric scooters. He's riding on the scooter. Mm-hmm. And Oh, if you get COVID, you get it. If you don't, you don't. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah I'm not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guy. Yeah. I was I was kind of like in a bubble. So I was going to work every day. Everyone was working from home. I'd go to work, see COVID, come home, watch the news. COVID. It was like COVID, mm-hmm. COVID, COVID all yeah, the time. Yeah, exactly. To the point where it definitely started. I think it started to affect all of us where we couldn't figure out why people wouldn't just wear their mask especially when we didn't have the answers. Like now we have way more information on it, more data. Mm -hmm. It's mutated so much that it's a different virus now, I think. But in the beginning, we didn't know anything and the the patients were getting sick and no one really believed it, which is sad. But that's the other thing. Yes. I mean, there was so much disbelief and misinformation going on, even from the top down. Well, even I have a great example of that. So I was in one of the COVID patients rooms and I was really close with the infectious disease doctor that I was working with. He was amazing. Mm -hmm. He actually recently passed away right after COVID, but while he was working, he was amazing. Like he knew everything. He was putting every single COVID patient on a trial, making sure that they would all get better. So I knew he was very informative. So one day I was in my patient's room and I was watching the news with her because I was doing a couple of things in the room And it said that we were going to start doing this certain type of therapy with the patients, basically giving them a blood thinner to just get rid of the COVID, which is very dangerous. And you wouldn't just give anyone this type of drug because they could bleed out. So I immediately went outside and they said they were doing it at Brigham Women's Hospital. This was all in the news. I went outside to him and I was like, I can't believe we're doing this. I don't feel comfortable with it. And he was like, that is a great example of why the news is wrong some of the time. And I was like, are we not doing that at all? And he goes, no, that was one crazy doctor who did it in New York. No one is going to do that. Like, that's a really bad idea. It could be detrimental mm-hmm. to patients. So that mm-hmm. in that moment, I realized how wrong some of the media was being and how misconstrued it could be. I was like, mm-hmm. I was in a COVID patient's room and I'm still getting the wrong information and I'm treating these patients. So that was an interesting <laughs> scenario that happened. <laughs> Christina, what kind of things did you and the other nurses do to deal with the stress of it all? Because how many days were you working? So it all depended if they needed a shift or not. So Brigham was amazing. They were willing to pay us extra if we came into work extra. So they were like, well, there's no cap to amount of nurses that if we need the nurses, we'll pay extra to get the nurses. So I was working overtime, but I was also in clinicals for grad school. (laughs) So between grad school clinicals and COVID, I was working almost seven days a week, but I'd say for my normal shifts, it was, I usually work three days a week. Sometimes it was five days a week. Sometimes it was four days a week, just real or staying extra. It was just really whenever they needed me. If you were working three days a week, you were doing 12 hours? Yeah. So that was my normal schedule. And then I did two days of clinical a week to just get that done if I was able to do it. And then I'd pick up either I'd do a 16 hour shift or I'd pick up two extra shifts that week. Whatever, if my boss needed an extra nurse, she knew my friends and I were able to do it. And we didn't have kids. So we were like, Mm -hmm. I can't see any of my friends anyways. We might as well just stay here. These are where my friends are. So I got lucky. I worked with some of my best friends and we were all on the floor together. And it sounds really weird because we're all in different places now. But sometimes we do text each other and we're like, wow, I wish we could just go back to like the beginning of COVID when we were all working together. And we had such Mm -hmm. a camaraderie. Obviously not with patients being sick and stuff, but right, but just then, being together and having yeah, sick. like we we always we would text each other, go, are you picking up extra tomorrow? Okay, I'll pick up extra tomorrow because it, we knew if we all had each other, it would go by quickly. It was a good shift because we would just help each other. So we mm-hmm. laughed through it sometimes. Other times we would get frustrated and bent to each other. But mm-hmm. I always had my friends with me, which was good. Um. Nice, nice. So you're not working in the hospital setting now. So tell us what you're doing now. So I finally hit my breaking point. It was quickly after that scenario happened with the patient who came in walking and talking, and I was told that he could not walk or talk. 
that I realized I just needed a break from the hospital. My family was like, no one is happy working at this hospital anymore. Not just Brigham, but everywhere. Like no nurse is happy right now. And my sister was working as a nurse educator for a pharmaceutical company. And my mom works in the pharmaceutical industry. So I thought, why don't I just take a look at this? I'm burnt out. I'm exhausted. And I don't think I'm giving the same care I would be giving if it was before COVID. I'm just Mm -hmm. exhausted. And so now I went over to the pharmaceutical industry. I started as a nurse educator and now I work as a rep. So I do some patient education in oncology. I do definitely miss patients and I loved taking care of patients, but I definitely needed a break where I was kind of away from the hospital and got my life back. I was just stressed out all the time. Yeah, you you needed a change. And yeah, that was a very stressful time for everyone, but especially for all of our healthcare workers. And anyone that, you know, was working maybe to to supply, you know, masks or, you know, other supplies that you needed, PPE or even meds, you know, stressful time for all those people that were trying to get supplies to you all. Yeah. And I, I, the last Christmas shift I worked, I had to basically lie to the administration office to tell them that the patient was going to die within the next like three hours in order to get his family in there because he didn't have COVID. He was an oncology patient. It was his last Christmas. He had just gotten uh, married to his husband. They had been together for like 10 years and they decided to finally get married. And then he was dying of cancer. So the doctors and I decided the policy was someone can come in to see a non-COVID patient if they are immediately going to die. Like if the patient is going to die within the next 24 hours. So it was Mm -hmm. Christmas Day. I knew it was his last Christmas and it was their first Christmas as a married couple. So the doctors and I decided he's already on hospice. He's going to die in a couple of weeks. We just don't need to tell them it's not going to be today. So yeah. we basically um, finagled the system to get the, mm-hmm. the family in there. But I was mm-hmm. really tired of having to make excuses for why family members could come in and see non-COVID patients. Wow. What a stressful and crazy time. <laughs> Also, when I went into the pharmaceutical industry, the the wildest part was when I first started at Brigham, they told us that they have the golden handcuffs on you. It's an amazing place to work, which it really is an amazing place to work. And I would recommend it to anyone. But I, I told people, you know, my mom works in pharmaceuticals. I don't know, maybe I will end up in that path one day. And I got a lot of discouragement about it. There were a lot of nurses who were like, I don't know why you would do that go to the dark side, blah, blah, blah. So I knew that. So I kind of kept it on the low key, you know, after I kind of got all the shade for it. Um, In in the middle of COVID, I decided to take this position and I got a phone call every day. I still get phone calls where nurses who are like, I'll never do that. Now are asking me, how can I get outside of the hospital? How can I get out where I'm not working in the hospital every day doing what you're, I need to do what you're doing. And it's people like the whole narrative has shifted the way people think about working in the hospital now, which is really sad because we do need nurses. Yeah. And, you know, you wonder, don't get sick, don't get sick because, you know, there are enough enough of them. They're quitting every day. (laughs) day. And they do. They definitely don't get paid enough for what they do. No, like I shared with you earlier, have a high, a high and healthy respect for, for the nurses. Because I, you know, got a, a real sense of yeah. all the training. And, you know, there's ongoing training. You know, we didn't talk about that. But there's ongoing CEU training that you oh, have. Oh, yeah, to- absolutely. You have yeah. to keep your license active. You have to keep doing classes. I got lucky. I, I kind of, I didn't cheat the system. But because I was in grad school, that counted as my CEUs. Oh, um, nice. But now I've graduated. So now i got to focus more on how to get the CEUs. I had to ask my friends, I was like, how did you guys do the CEUs? I've never had to really do them because courses for grad school count as your CEUs. But Mm -hmm. if you're not in grad school or you're not taking courses, um, your CEUs, you have to go find them and get continuing education for, I think it's like 35 CEUs a year or something or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends on the state. But so that's 35 extra hours on top of your job a year that you have to do some type of learning module or education. Yeah, I know at Kaiser, they used to set up different uh, CEU trainings to make it a little easier for some of the nurses 
to get those CEUs. But yeah, that's still a lot. And yeah. there's still the, um, you know, you get a new drug that you're dealing with and that gets on the formulary and you all need to be trained in it. So there's that training going on yep, too. Absolutely. That happens on the floors. Yep. So yeah, it's a lot of uh, continuing education. Mm-hmm. So how do you like what you're doing now? So I was doing nurse education before this new role that I'm in, and I'm kind of doing that right now too. I love educating nurses on the actual aspect of the specific drug. So I'm in oncology, so I do immunotherapy or I was doing immunotherapy. Now I'm doing an oral cancer drug. Mm-hmm. I just like teaching the adverse events to make sure that the nurses are ready for what they might see, because mm-hmm. I definitely had situations where I was like, why is this patient so sick? I don't understand because I didn't have the knowledge of that specific drug. Mm-hmm. So I definitely do like it. I do miss parts of the hospital. I definitely do. I miss working with my friends and that I was working with during COVID and before COVID. And I miss the patients, but I do like what I'm doing now because I see a different aspect of the healthcare industry. And I also get to see like what the perspectives are on the outside and how I can help the narrative. So I'm definitely, I educate people within my company all the time and they're open to it of saying, you know, they're like, Oh, I I don't know why this doctor won't see us. And I'm like, well, this is what their day looks like every day. Or this nurse doesn't, I don't know. They just, just kind of educating them on what their day looks like from an outsider's perspective. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't, it's not just them treating patients all day. It's very stressful. There's a lot of stuff going on. So I I feel like I'm bringing a lot to the table from the hospital and bringing it over to this industry now and just saying, hey, this is what it looks like from the inside. This is what it felt like for COVID and the whole healthcare industry has changed. So let's kind of change the narrative and try to all work together. It's It's a nice new challenge. I do like it. Mm, great, great. Well, I'm glad you've, you're you able to switch to a different career, but that still relies on the knowledge and all the training that you've put in to yourself, right? Yeah. For your own career. It is nice within my company now and the one I just worked for prior. They all respect nurses. They respect doctors. They want to know how they can best help them. It's nice being with companies that do really respect the process and what it takes and they respect, you know, the patient, what does the patient actually need? So it's nice to be Mm -hmm. able to give my perspective of what happened so they can understand what the, the healthcare industry looks like now, because it did change. And I don't think it's ever going to go back to the way it was. Nothing's going back to the way it was. That's me. Yeah. Well, Christina, I so appreciate you sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing that you're doing this. We need more people like you to get the word out there. <laughs> Absolutely. You are so welcome. And I, I do feel it's very important, right, for us, you know, the general public to know and understand, you know, what went on and what might be going on if we have, because they're talking about another surge, right? Because yeah. It's strain, so we'll see. Hopefully it won't be anywhere near as bad as the last. Thank you for all of your insights. Thank you for, you know, you say thank you for your service to service people, you know, people in the military. But Mm -hmm. thank you for all that you did during that time, because it was a great cost to you uh, Mm -hmm. on a personal basis and uh, your friends as well. So just really appreciate you. And I appreciate the time that you're taking with us today. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for listening. And your support's a blessing. If you enjoyed the podcast, give us a positive rating on Apple. It will help our podcast ranking on all the major sites like Apple, Google, Spotify, etc. We release new podcasts every two weeks on the first and third Wednesdays. Now your support is needed. Keep listening and share these career-changing podcasts with your friends your family, your co-workers, and anyone else you feel it will bless. In addition to the major sites, they can also find these podcasts on my website at insiderscareerclub.com. Now, if you're not happy with your career, let me help you. I can help you get your career on track. Sign up for a free coaching call with me today. Before you go, Let's speak victory over you. You have a bright future. Good breaks are looking for you. 
and new doors are about to swing wide open with opportunity. Believe it. Until next time, take care.